horror and anxiety are interesting subject of, subjects of conversation, and they obsess the human race no end. I think that most people deal with horror and anxiety, uh, panic, terror, that sort of thing, in a kind of a haphazard way. Um, we dabble in it. We um, do little things to stir up a little bit of it in us from time to time. Um, but I don't think that we ever deal with the phenomenon of horror itself in a systematic way, except in little snippets. Um, what interests me is the, as I've mentioned, is the idea of existential horror, existential panic. The horror at being alive, the horror at existing, not just being alive, but the horror at actually existing. Now, I have to point out here at the beginning that not everybody has experienced this, and some people, when they hear about existential panic, they sort of think, this person is just plain crazy, which is possible, I suppose, um, but it is a real phenomenon, whether or not uh, people recognize it as such, uh, if they've never experienced it, then they simply have no way of knowing what you're talking about when you refer to things like existential horror. Um, but uh, angst, anxiety, is one of the central themes of the existentialists, and uh, it's something that interests me. Uh, in particular, um, fear and horror as motivators. What are you going to do uh, to be delivered from fear and horror? What are you going to do to be... Uh, what are you going to give up, <laughs> sacrifice, in order to be delivered from these things, from panic and horror and anxiety and terror. Um, I think that people are going to give up an awful lot. And I think that because of the things on which horror um, acts, it acts on, your, on the part of your mind that you're not quite so in control of, um, that it can overwhelm your reasoning faculties without you realizing that the, that it's doing that. <clears throat> so if you want to um, if you want to control somebody, uh, cause them to fear something. Um, cause them to fear you, maybe, cause them to fear reality and set yourself up as the savior from that fear. Uh, that's why religions always have things like terms like liberation, salvation, escape, um, that kind of thing. Those sorts of metaphors. Generally, it's you're escaping from some horrific fate. Um, now, <clears throat> the flip side of that is, of course, um, what uh, what are the other things that can be used to control you? Well, there, there was 1984 where fear was the ultimate controlling mechanism. Fear and pain. Um, uh, humiliation, that kind of thing, just negative states that were applied relentlessly to people. But then there's Brave New World, where desire is used to control everybody. Uh, drugs, uh, sex, pleasure is what people are, uh, what is held up to people as a means of controlling them. It's, uh, it, the, the argument is actually made in that book, Brave New World, that pleasure is actually a lot more useful in terms of controlling people. Um, but there's also hope, which doesn't seem to be uh, all that much involved in pleasure. Uh, you can just, I'm not talking about hope of pleasure, by the way, I'm talking about hope in and of itself. Now, I mentioned that some people have never ex experienced existential panic, existential angst, existential fear. It's entirely possible that some people have never experienced hope. So to abandon hope, uh, to overcome fear, is something that isn't that big of a sacrifice to them. Uh, they all of they, that which has value in their life is that which they fear, is that which they that causes horror in them. So they will do anything, uh, rational or irrational, to deal with that fear. Whereas people, I suppose, who aren't so prone to fear and are more prone to hoping for things, uh, hoping, say, for some sort of desire fulfillment, uh, can be controlled that way. Um, do as I say and I'll inject you full of lovely drugs that make you feel really nice. Uh, or I'll give you 50 
blonde bombshells of your choice, or I'll uh, uh, give you a million dollars, or uh, that kind of thing. They're often two sides of the same coin. Um, the ancient world, the ancient Greeks and Romans, didn't have a very um, positive view of the afterlife. Their point sort of was, look, this is as, as good as it gets, so you might as well ruthlessly uh, prosecute your own dominance in this world, because the next world, when you see, you know, in, as you see in things like the, the Greek tragedies or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey, uh, views of the afterlife in these uh, ancient Greek and Roman literature is not very good. It's just these people uh, wandering around aimlessly and uh, sort of zombie-like and in low-level kind of misery and listlessness forever. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so you, you, you now live in an existence that's devoid of hope, which is the, um, you know, the, the words that are nailed over hell as you go in in Dante's Inferno, abandon hope all you enter here. <clears throat> so, of course, along comes Mr. Christian and says, I can deliver you from this, from this miserable afterlife. Um, just do as I say, and uh, I'll give you something called hope. And not just hope for pleasure, which is sort of the sort of thing that people accuse Muslims of doing, is you have to be puritanical in li this life in order to be uh, Rabelaisian in the next life. But they... Um, uh, the, the Christians, uh, and, and, to the, and to be fair, the Muslims do this too, you're living in transcendal, transcendent bliss for all eternity after you tip over, and all you have to do really is sign here on the dotted line to follow what I'm saying. Hope can be an enormous motivator as well. Uh, it's the attraction repulsion mechanism again. Um, existential hope. Hmm. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because Existential fear is fear of something that hasn't actually come upon you. Um, and it, when it comes to true horror, whenever you actually end up facing that which you fear the most, it loses its sting rapidly. You sort of go, okay, what's the point of fearing it now, since I'm in it? Fear is fear of something that hasn't happened yet. Hope is hope of something that hasn't happened yet. Um, they're both sort of um, states that have some sort of, uh, some sort of, disconnect between oneself and themselves. I am in a state of hope, therefore I have not achieved that for which I hope. I am in a state of fear, therefore I have not experienced that which I fear. Uh, there's still some sort of disconnection between the two, even though there is a connection. It's not uh, a completely established connection yet. I still hope for a million bucks because I don't have a million bucks yet. Once I get a million bucks, I don't have to hope for it anymore. It's a sure thing. Same thing if I fear being tossed into the fiery furnace for all eternity. Once I've been tossed into the fiery furnace for all eternity, well, what's the point of fearing it anymore? I've just got flames and pitchforks and demons and stuff like that to deal with. It's not a question of fearing it happening because it's actually happened. So these things are two, um, two control mechanisms, I suppose, or they, they simply may be things that, that come up inherently in our sort of view of the universe, our teleological view of ourselves, that uh, I'm in one state one moment and I'm in another state the next moment. On the existential level, um, I think you brush with pure horror itself. And it's sort of a horror of annihilation. If you've, I mentioned in my previous video, anxiety and panic attacks. If you've ever actually suffered an existential panic attack, I have. Um, not a nice feeling at all. Uh, the, the feeling is you're about to evaporate. You're about to be completely annihilated. Uh, you're uh, just going to, poof, ex cease to exist. And the existentialists say that the fear of that is the fear of nothing. Uh, you're not even going to be, you know, you're not even going to uh, uh, go anywhere. You're just going to cease to exist. You are, you are going to not just step into a void, you are going to become a void, a vacuum, nothing. Um, and again, the existentialists seem to think that this is sort of an inevitable part of life, an inevitable part of existence is this, this state of anxiety. Um, but I would sort of say that if we're used to this idea of 
nothingness. If we actually attempt to wrap our heads around the entire concept and what it might mean, the fear uh, is allayed and our reasoning capacity is thereby enhanced because we know that we can't see things in a straightforward, um, non-biased manner as long as our fears and desires are involved. So if you're going to deal with things like existential panic or panic or fear or terror or anxiety as things in and of themselves, you have to, I guess, come to terms with whatever it is that you fear. Um, I'm not sure how many uh, of the existentialists actually said this is how you overcome fear, existential anxiety. Um, apart from, well, don't worry, it's inevitable and everybody feels it, so there's really no point in getting worked up about it. That seems to be the, about as far as they seem to go. Nietzsche seems to go farther than that, but he says, look, you've got to find your own way out of this pit of fear uh, yourself. There's, there's, there's really no roadmap out of it. Um, but there is a way out, but you've got to find it. Nobody can show you the way out of this mess, uh, or the way to perhaps not just the way out of the mess, but the way to the, uh, the, uh, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, and, and again, you've got, the, uh, you've got the conflict between the positive and the negative. You've got the conflict between what is the highest good. Is it to escape bad? Um, or is the highest good to transcend bad altogether and head towards something good. And if you are heading towards something good, what on earth is it? Paint me a picture of where it's going, where you're going with this. Well, existentially, I don't really see how you can paint a picture of existential fulfillment. Um, just in the same way as that it's almost impossible to describe existential angst to somebody. Like you're just, it's a generalized fear of absolutely everything. It's a fear of your own existence. It goes beyond, I mentioned Ligotti yesterday, it goes beyond even feeling disgusted and repulsed by your own existence and your own horror of being encased in this human body that you're in. Uh, it's, it's a horror of simply existing. Now imagine what uh, existential joy would feel like. <laughs> How would you describe that? You can't really. So when, when somebody is sort of saying, well, yeah, there is a way out of existential horror, it's existential joy, or I don't know, whatever the counterpart is, they say, okay, great, that's a great idea. Explain it to me. I can't. Ugh. You can't explain it to me. No, but can I explain to you what you just felt five minutes ago? Existential panic. No, you can't explain that either. Try and explain that to somebody who's never felt it. They, don't, they, they, they have no idea what you're talking about. Well, it's the same thing about ex as, as existential joy, uh, presumably, um, or existential fulfillment, existential self-actualization, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. How do you explain that to somebody? How do you explain that state? Um, you can't. Um, somebody will say, well, then it doesn't exist. Well, okay, then. Then the horror doesn't exist either, right? Because you can't explain that. You can fire a million examples at me as to what that horror is uh, is brought on by, but you can't explain the horror itself. You can say heaps of bodies and, and uh, living in a horrible environment with lingering death and pollution and, and terror and fear and violence and... and torture and all this kind of thing but that's not really those are those are things that bring this horror on they're not the horror itself uh, literature has tried for eons well as long as literature has been around uh, to express what horror really is and it's always failed uh, by the same token it's attempted to come out and tell us what say existential fundamental joy or fundamental um, uh, being is. Um, and again, that tends to fail as well. Um, it, it, you really, it's, it's a state that you can't really describe. And it's not even really something that you have to intuit towards either. Um, because if you've ever experienced either state, 
Uh, if you ever had a, a moment of existential panic and you try to explain it, explain to somebody who was around you what what just happened, if you're like, <laughs> you know, you've you've kind of lost it and you know you've gotten terrified and you're trying desperately to explain to people around you what just happened to you and please help me get out of this state and they don't know what you're talking about and that actually adds to your panic is you're completely alone in this. You you can't even describe it to them what it's like. Um, I would assume that the opposite, existential joy or existential fulfillment, would feel pretty much exactly the same way. You go, wow, this is so great. Oh, never mind. There's no point in talking to anybody about this. Um, it's like shooting up, I suppose, is a crude analogy. Um, or, you know, snorting cocaine or something like this. Just try and explain what you just experienced to somebody who hasn't done that. They don't know what you're talking about, and they can't know what you're talking about. Uh, words fail miserably in a, in a, in a state like that. Um, so the existential states are very difficult to actually communicate to anyone else. Um, as I said, uh, the existential 20, 20th century philosophers, or 19th and 20th, have attempted to talk about it. Um, in both sort of cryptic uh, Nietzschean language and the more uh, clinical Sartrean language, and they both admit that they've not really described it, you know, what they're talking about all that effectively. Um, even by the use of that, the kind of terminology they use is something of an admission of failure. So, fear. Do you, do people actually know what that is? And if they do know what it is, do they know how to deal with it? Do they know how to approach fear to try and not even necessarily overcome it, but to um, transcend it, I guess, put it in its proper place in the grand scheme of things, as opposed to uh, trying to kill it off or run from it? You can't really do either, I don't think. Um, but again, if, you, if the negative actually has... Uh, Reality, or it, or if it is something that has a real possibility of acting on you, then it, the corollary is unavoidably uh, the positive. So, um, if we're going to sort of accept the negative, if we're going to accept the horror and the fear, and try to uh, become part of it, I suppose, or make it part of us, or an accepted part of the totality that is us, we have to sort of accept and absorb the 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 joy of life as well it's it, it's not a question of either or um, it's not a optimist pessimist kind of view it's a it's a holistic view uh, some people might not like that word use whatever word you want uh, it's an attempt to actually integrate everything that is the state that I find is is the most useful when dealing with existential issues, negative existential issues, is to not try to overcome them or run from them. Uh, run from the dark recesses of your mind, because <laughs> all you are is your mind, essentially, so you can't run from that. You can, ex you can distract yourself by the outside world, as Apfi says we all do, uh, because he implies that the crisis is so bad that we, in the very nature of things, it cannot be faced. Other people say that it can be faced, and that escaping from that moment of primal horror is part of what we are, part of a, a or at least a desire that we have. But facing it ultimately is a lot better because when you face it, you also unlock uh, the door to the positive. <laughs> Another ramble. <laughs>